Hello everyone and welcome back to Solid State Physics in a Nutshell, brought to you by the Colorado School of Mines. I'm Eric. And I'm Nicole. To start this off, recall from the free electron model that we developed an expression for the electron density in the parabolic dispersion. We were also able to show that the conductivity has a direct relationship to the free carrier concentration N. And even though we have bands and band gaps now, turns out that we can use the same approach and get to a similar expression for conductivity. To that end, the goal today is to develop an expression for the carrier concentration in an intrinsic semiconductor. However, we want to be a bit careful. Back in the free electron day, we only had N, but now we have holes to deal with. Okay, so we'll have one concentration for all the electrons N, and one for all the holes P. Well, we won't look at all the electrons, only those in the conduction band, because electrons in the filled bands at lower energy don't contribute. Oh, right. And similarly, we'd only count holes in the valence band. Now I know we already have an expression for N from the free electron model. Can we use the same form even though we get funky behavior at the Brillouin zone edge? Yeah, provided the number of conduction electrons is small. We'll approximate the bottom of the band with a parabola, and this approach will be valid while that fit is good. For the density of states expression, it will be similar in form to the one from the free electron model, except the energy is offset by the energy of the conduction band, and we have a correction for the band mass. And the Fermi-Dirac distribution would be the same, right? Actually, we can simplify it a tiny bit by assuming the Fermi level is somewhere within the gap, and the system is at relatively low temperature. Plugging all this into Mathematica, we get N. Awesome! Now, how do you think this is going to change for holes? Hmm. Well, we'll start with the same integral form. The energy offset in the density of states will just be the energy of the valence band edge, minus E, and the band mass correction will be for holes. And what about the Fermi-Dirac distribution? Wouldn't it just be the same? Nope. When we talk about holes, what are we counting? The empty states. So this Fermi-Dirac distribution would be 1 minus the Fermi-Dirac for electrons. There you go. Now we plug all of this in, and we get an expression for P. Mm, since an intrinsic semiconductor has the same density of electrons and holes, we should be able to set these two expressions equal to each other. Okay, cool. Let's give that a shot. Taking the natural log of both sides, we end up with an expression for the chemical potential as a function of the band gap, temperature, and the effective mass. Let's see if we can rationalize the behavior predicted by this expression. Nicole, what happens at zero Kelvin? Well, the second term disappears altogether, leaving the Fermi level halfway in the gap. And here we're invoking the Fermi level and the chemical potential are effectively the same term. Okay, now let's turn the temperature up. The second term also depends on the relative band masses. Let's start by assuming that we have bands with the same curvature at the band edges. In other words, m star for the electrons is the same as m star for the holes. Thus, their density of states is also the same. If that's the case, where would you want to put your Fermi level for such an intrinsic semiconductor? I'd want to put it at a symmetric point so that the Fermi-Dirac distribution in the conduction band equals the Fermi-Dirac distribution in the valence band. So once again, we'll find it in the middle of the gap. And this is consistent with our expression since the natural log of 1 is 0. But what about if my conduction band density of states was a lot larger than my valence band? You're saying that the conduction band edge has a larger band mass. Exactly. A really heavy conduction band edge. So for the moment, let's keep our Fermi level in the center of the gap. And over here, let's plot the product of D and F. In the conduction band, we'd multiply this part of F times D and get this large blob. And in the valence band, we'd multiply this part of the Fermi-Dirac distribution times D because FH is 1 minus Fe. This blob's quite a bit smaller, and that doesn't seem right. Should the area under each curve be equal if it's an intrinsic semiconductor? So what do you think we should do? Well, we could shift the Fermi-Dirac function until the areas are equal. Oh, so the asymmetry shifts the Fermi energy off the center of the band gap. And this is exactly what we see for this expression. Good stuff! So is this all for intrinsic carrier concentration? Almost. There's one final thing we should introduce that will be even more important in extrinsic semiconductors. In equilibrium at some temperature, we expect there's some value for N and P for a given material, right? 
Sure, it's an equilibrium, and we just figured out what that value is. And we achieve this equilibrium through the balance of excitation of electrons from the surrounding black body radiation and a recombination of electrons with holes. For the excitation process, let's call this rate A. What do you think it depends on? Well, I'd expect it to depend on temperature, and if I assume that there are a lot of electrons still at the valence band edge, I can probably ignore the carrier concentration. Cool. How about the recombination rate? Let's call that B. Again, I'd expect that to depend on temperature, but this time I expect it's also going to depend on N and P, since the excited electron has to have holes to recombine with. Okay, so we can expect that the recombination rate is going to depend on the product of N and P. Together, we can say that the change in N with time is given by A as a function of T minus B as a function of T times N times P. But at equilibrium, there should be no change in N with time. So we can solve for N times P as a function of A over B. So it looks like the product of N and P is independent of the impurity concentration. Let's see if this result agrees with what we developed earlier. Taking our expressions for N and P and multiplying them together, we obtain the following expression. Ah, so the Fermi level doesn't appear in this expression. It's all about the band structure and temperature. Yeah, and this is consistent with our discussion of excitation and recombination rates. Let's look for a moment at representative numbers of the NP product. For silicon at room temperature, it's 2 times 10 to the 19 carriers per centimeter to the 6th power. So in an intrinsic semiconductor, we have an electron and hole concentration populations of 4 times 10 to the 9 carriers per centimeter cubed. Not a lot of free carriers, given that a cubic centimeter of silicon holds about 0.1 moles of silicon atoms, or about 6 times 10 to the 22 atoms. So one excited electron for every 10 trillion atoms. It's a pretty tiny number, but I guess you're asking electrons to jump a 1.1 electron volt gap at 300 Kelvin. You said it. Okay, we're going to come back to this NP expression when we cover extrinsic semiconductors. And it looks like it's a good time for a recap for today. So we use the density of states and the Fermi-Dirac distribution to obtain an expression for the concentration of electrons in the conduction band and of holes in the valence band. And we connected these concentrations to an equilibrium process of excitation and recombination of electrons across the gap. This pointed us towards the NP product rule, which will prove useful in extrinsic semiconductors. And as usual, we have some questions for you to consider at home. First, would the NP product rule continue to hold if I placed my semiconductor in sunlight. Or, how about if we doped the semiconductor? Ooh, that's a fun one. Here's another. Let's say through the black magic of chemistry, I create a band structure that has two minima in the conduction band and one maxima in the valence band as so. Assuming all three band edges have the same effective mass, where is the equilibrium location of E Fermi at some finite temperature T? And last, but certainly not least, what is the temperature dependence on E Fermi when the two band masses are the same? That wraps up our discussion on intrinsic carrier concentrations. Next time we're going to look at the mobility of these carriers. Thanks for watching Solid State Physics in a Nutshell. See you next time.